Around December last year, I decided to finally play the Bioshock series due to the incredibly positive things I heard about 1 and 2, with 2 being a little more divisive, and honestly, not to my surprise, I enjoyed both of the games a lot, with any issues I did have being nitpicks or slight annoyances that for the most part didn't detract from the experience. There was just one more game that I needed to play and took a break before I did, because unlike the others, I've heard incredibly mixed things about it from both my comment section and in general, and that game is Bioshock Infinite. Who are you? My name is DeWitt. Come to get you out of here. You come from my land. How dangerous can one little girl be? The girl is the flame that shall ignite the world. What did I do to them? You frightened them. Good. I can get you out of here. You've come to lead my lamb astray, but thy crook is bent and thy... We are going to find Comstock. I will stop him. This will end in blood. Comstock! Tell me what you want! Go back to the Sodom from which you came! You came. Elizabeth! Bring us the girl and wipe away the debt. Hey. Hey, the deal's off, you hear me? The deal's off! Are you afraid of God? No, but I'm afraid of you. I've heard the story is horrible, the gameplay sucks, it wasn't what it was meant to be, the game is confusing, all of which are pretty much nothing but negative or detracting descriptions. So here I am, finally checking out Bioshock Infinite to answer that question of, is Bioshock Infinite really that bad? Bioshock Infinite, like the original Bioshock, is made by Irrational Games as their last game before being shuttered, and spearheaded by a decent amount of that original team. When hearing this, you, like me, are probably surprised by how mixed this game ended up being. This is due to the game's well-known and controversial development cycle. The game's development, to put it lightly, was an absolutely unorganized, chaotic nightmare. This admittedly is attributed to the game's director and lead writer, Ken Levine. By his own admission, he is not a leader. He is creative and a lot of those thoughts and ideas end up being kinda crazy. This led to plenty of rewrites and weird design choices that led to the large portion of what was shown in things such as E3, or talked about, just not being in the game due to its original scope being too big, especially for the hardware at the time and work ethic. I don't think I can do it again. But what does that actually look like for someone who hasn't played the game and just heard about it? Bioshock Infinite takes place in 1912 and is about you. Eighth generation console man, I mean uh, Booker DeWitt, a former Pinkerton who owns a detective agency voiced by our savior, Troy Baker, on a job to give us the girl and wipe away the debt. A phrase which you will hear a lot as we try to find this girl known as Elizabeth. At the start of this job, we are taken to a lighthouse, just like in the original Bioshock with an incredibly innovative, challenging, and difficult puzzle. Wait a minute, that card. We take this ride not down into Rapture with Ryan's speech like in the original, but far into the skies above these dark clouds and oppressive oceans to the bright and beautiful Columbia with Comstock's faith as our guide. Attention! Attention! Alright, just stay calm. 5,000 feet. 10,000 feet. 15,000 feet. Hallelujah.
This shows you immediately that Columbia is far different from Rapture, as Rapture was a city dedicated to the diverse cultures, capitalist freedom, and objectivist view of life where, regardless of your skin or race, hard work can get you anywhere. Columbia was instead founded on religious belief, American exceptionalism that must be spread, and for the white man. The game does everything it can to show you this isn't Rapture, and you feel that as soon as you step in Columbia. Instead of being attacked and rushed away, you are greeted with open arms, although you must be baptized to enter. I baptize you in the name of our prophet, in the name of our founders, and the name of our Lord. I am under the water. Please help me. Here. I don't know, brothers and sisters, but this one doesn't look clean to me. Then are immediately shown a functional society celebrating its anniversary. People are happy here and just enjoying life with their friendly neighbors, all of which are excited for the raffle being held during the event. But even though we are welcome, unknown to them, we bear the mark of their false okay, shepherd. Okay. As long as we hide it, we get to enjoy the festivities and get what seems to be an easy job, until we reach the raffle. Prettiest young white girl in all of Columbia! <laughs> Alright then, the winner is... Number 77! Oh, what do you know? Over here! Over here! He's the winner! Number 77! Come and claim your prize! First throw! The reward was lynching a mixed-race couple. Columbia's dark secret under its cheery exterior is that it's very racist and not a good place for non-white people to be. Looks like we've got a shy one here! Bitch. Wait! It's him! Now, where'd you get that brand, boy? Don't you know that makes you the backstabbing snake in the grass, false shepherd? And we ain't letting no false shepherd into our flock! <laughs> Show them what we got planned, boys! Well, it's now not a good place for us to be either, and it's our job to get the girl, even if it brings ruin to this city. The first thing you'll notice after being released upon Columbia like I did are the visuals, because they are downright gorgeous at times, with bright, occupied skyboxes and architectural marvels. If there's one thing that Irrational Games seems to have a complete hold on is the style they wanted. This city uses a neoclassical and colonial American theme to convey what a flying city made by Americans in 1893 might have looked like, and it worked like a charm. As someone who's visited historical American sites like George Washington's house, this felt really genuine in what it would look like, especially with the amount of things that exist in the environment just to make it feel like it was lived in, like occupied stores or dirty streets. Just looking at how much is happening and with how surprisingly high fidelity it is, it makes me wonder how this even worked on something like a PS3 or Xbox 360 when it came out. Like yeah, now pretty much anyone can run this, but damn that must have been a hell of a task to accomplish. Outside of those believable parts and onto the more technical parts, such as, well, you know, the Flying City part, there is a really clockwork, almost steampunk vibe to it, which is funny because it takes place long before that concept. Technology in that style looks like it chugs along with its gears churning, and it often feels the same way when pulling a lever or riding along the sprawling skylines with the skyhook. This is helped by the honestly really good effects and particles used to add depth to the clouds, sparks from damaged machines, or blood from killed enemies. Character models for those enemies and NPCs alike are really high quality here with a lot of care and attention. All models are stylized and not entirely realistic, but are fairly highly detailed, with good texture work and actual modeling done to make them unique. A far cry from the original Bioshock. Booker himself, while admittedly looking like Xbox Man, is well designed and even gets changed based on story events like here, where I get my hands tapped at the beginning of the game, and it's like that for the rest of the experience. Elizabeth, who we will be with for a long while, also looks fantastic, even after all the different iterations she went through in the development process. You can feel the innocence she starts with in her design and mannerisms, as well as how that changes with her model. This especially helps when in crowds, as here in Infinite we have plenty of cases where we'll be forced to interact or walk through them to get from point A to B, or just explore. Hey, Miss. Miss Elizabeth. Hello. 
Oh, this is wonderful. Well, come dance with me, Mr. Dennis. I don't dance. Come on, let's go. Why? What could be better than this? Well, how about Paris? Paris? How? I don't understand. How could we get there? That's where that airship's going, but if you want to stay and dance, we can... No, let's go. Come on, let's go. Come on, let's go right now. Even in these big crowds full of nameless NPCs, the design work is good enough here where I found myself in these sections often just stopping to look at the people and listen to what's going on because they do stand it out enough to be interesting. In these segments, we also get to see that the audio design in this game is also really, really good. Voice acting remains believable with every line delivered incredibly well from the main cast, and even those previously mentioned NPCs which have fun dialogue. Hmm. Look at him, ladies. It's a crime someone doesn't get him a nice set of trunks. <laughs> Booker himself, as mentioned before, is voiced by Troy Baker, who delivers an, as usual, excellent performance. You can feel everything from his astonishment to the wild reality that is Columbia, to desperation to get Elizabeth. It was a fine thing you came along when you did. How do you think I ended up here? I gambled, and now I owe money to men you don't want to be in debt to. I come here to pay it back, me busting you out. What do you think that was? Charity? Who sent you? Somebody who was willing to take my marker in exchange for you. Speaking of Elizabeth, she's also really good here with, with how much effort they put into her to make her feel like a worthy companion, and not just a really annoying NPC. She's fun, and her voice lines reflect that and more as she changes along your journey to get her out of Columbia and away from Comstock, who also has really good dialogue and portrays the fanatical religious prophet really, really well. The Lord forgives everything. I'm just a prophet, so I don't have to. Amen. Amen. Jesus! Even audio logs return as voxophones here. They serve the same purpose as the last games, that being to provide exposition or sometimes instructions a hint. Although, I will admit, none of these felt as memorable or stood out to me as much as the previous games. I have a pressing need to speak to this so-called False shepherd, stirring up so much trouble. We got enough problems without this damn fool shooting up the city and blaming it all on the Vox. Though if he's amiable, yeah, yeah, he might be just the fellow we need for our immediate concerns. Outside of voice acting and more towards gameplay and the world, everything is really, really good here as well. Everything in Columbia has that clockwork vibe and you can hear it in the city's basic functions with steam hissing, tesla coils sparking, and heavy gears churning. The wind here, while surprisingly calm, gets just as swift when soaring through it on the skylines at breakneck speeds. Crowds feel rightly populated with the right amount of NPC conversations and actions with typically a really nice selection of older music, both made for the game and real. It gives off a cheery atmosphere that can be off-putting in a good way when entering a situation where that music is still playing post or during a massacre. I personally feel like this all interacts with you fairly okay. You aren't in confined spaces or in a giant suit, so you really don't need super heavy footsteps. Instead, you sound like a normal guy walking through water, on brick roads, on wood, or running out of breath. It isn't anything special, but it doesn't need to be, and it doesn't make the game any less immersive. Luckily, the gameplay department is fantastic sounding and feeling with Booker. With, for the first time in the series for me, I thought every weapon sounded really good, and I didn't have any issues with anything being crazy loud, and plasmids, now known as tonics, still exude the almost magical power behind them. If your quarry dwells in the jungle and beds down with the local cult. The gameplay part of Infinite is where I heard a lot of the issues people had with the game were, and unfortunately, I can understand why. If you ever wanted an example of two steps forward, one step back, this is it. First of all, when booting up the game, you have difficulty options, of which I only recommend hard, as even on hard, the game is stupidly easy. We still have the tonic system and an incredibly large variety of guns in the game's more smooth FPS gameplay, with the game's new roster of unique and varied enemies. However, they decided to limit you to two guns like COD or Halo and remove the dual wield system. The weapons, like I said, feel good and are fun to use with 14 different options. 
We still have the shotgun, which feels devastating. The handgun, which feels alright. And for once, an RPG in a Bioshock game that I actually really like. They are all for different jobs and playstyles like long range engagements with a sniper, or close range right at enemies' faces, and do make sense in context like that sniper due to us being in the sky, opposed to Rapture's rivet guns or crossbows because you're underwater. The big issue for me is while they are fun, it is kinda generic to use on their own, feeling like Call of Duty or early level Borderlands 2. Although, I will admit that Revolver becomes easily my favorite gun in the franchise. This is offset by the Tonics, which replace Plasmids and are mostly the same from the previous games with a few removed or new. Some are really fun, like the Returning Charge. A shield which lets you throw damage back and becomes the only one you need. Or my favorite combo, Bucking Bronco to raise enemies, then Murder of Crows to damage them all while they're stuck in the air. Another thing I really like is how every one of those tonics has a cutscene for when you first get them, not just an introduction movie. I just love how it shows what it does to your body when you take these dangerous genome changing bugs. Due to there being no dual wielding, the hold option has turned into mostly traps on a large portion of the tonics, and I used the traps maybe once or twice when I was required, because they just don't work with the aggressive gameplay loop for me, as it forces you to play passive when all of the weapons want you to be aggressive. Even worse for tonics is that I don't think there are any environmental things you can take advantage of spread out enough that you can practically use. For instance, I never once hit water with shock jockey or oil with fire to burn an enemy. There is just no environmental hazard you can use besides throwing enemies off the ledge, which I will admit is really fun to do, but it makes the game feel a little shallow. Of course, we have to use these weapons on something, and it's Columbia's police and Comstock's army. And the reason I haven't mentioned them is they really don't shine at all. They have traditional roles like usual. Melee enemies, ranged enemies, heavy ranged, snipers, special enemies with tonics, robots, and more. Don't get me wrong, I really like them from an artistic point of view and I think their designs are really good. But they just aren't as interesting as Rapture Splicers with their little stories and environmental storytelling. Even mechanics like hacking to turn drones against each other was just removed and replaced by possession, making it as simple as click and have enough salts to afford the skill. But even then, enemies are just things you kill to further your own goal, which from a story perspective works and makes sense, but just doesn't build that same interest, which is probably due to the game's incredibly linear nature. That led to the removal of the Big Daddy system in exchange for Elizabeth. <laughs> Uh, hello. Ah! Oh, ah! Hey! Knock it off! Stop it! Will you stop it? I'm not here to hurt you. Who are you? Elizabeth, like I said earlier, is a character I really like and is fun to have around. She's technically your protection job, but she can handle herself so she doesn't actually need protection and can help you in combat by throwing you health, ammo, salts, or even money. It really makes it not feel like an escort mission that's annoying. More compelling are the tears she can open. Tears are rifts into other realities in which she can pull something for a short time, but only one can be active at a time. This can be a sentry automaton, a flying gun drone, terrain, supplies, and even water. These are really cool and add a fun dynamic to combat to make it feel a little more unique when she's around. She can also, when out of combat, pick locks if you have enough lockpicks available, which take the place of puzzles for loot or hacking. And it's kind of bad. It isn't interactive at all, and for the most part, gives really lame rewards, which are usually just money. There are also a few side things that need keys, but both of these things lead to more annoying backtracking than fun. Overall, while she is a great addition, I'm not too sure she was worth the removal to Big Daddy system. 
In the original, it was not only a fun combat encounter that required you to think before you act, but also a fun way of acquiring power, as it felt like you earned that atom and worked for this upgrade. In Infinite, everything is just tied to money, which on hard, I didn't get much of, and because of the pure amount of weapon upgrades and plasmids, you really can't get a lot of upgrades and have to be picky. And on top of that, there are no visual updates to the weapons like the last two and the tonic upgrades. While some are cool, most are just really not interesting at all. You can tell they did try to make it feel similar with the handymans which have interesting dialogue, but they are just such a nightmare to fight because they're high damage and health. I just never felt excited to take one down like a big daddy. Instead, I was annoyed and just felt unsatisfied after they were dead. And unsatisfied is how I would describe a lot of the story after the second half. I'll be talking about the story and characters a bit after this section in depth with spoilers. So if you don't want to hear any of those, just in case you want to check it out, go here. Truth be told, I don't have much to say about the first half of the game's story. It is pretty good with a decent amount of standout moments, but nothing crazy as it's just an introduction. So I'll highlight what I really liked. After the fair, which was an amazing sequence that I genuinely think this game is playing for alone, we get a couple of linearish sections that led us to where Elizabeth is, who is supposed to be Columbia's lamb that will take over, allegedly lives. We quickly find, however, that while she technically lives here, the more accurate term would be contained. Whatever she is requires a gigantic machine to keep her powers under control, and is monitored in practically every room with zero privacy. On top of that, we get another personal view of how colored people are treated from a few voxophones. I guess even in a restricted area, these crackers need someone to clean the floors. <laughs> Those politicians and scientists don't bother about what they say around me because I'm some half-leaded colored boy. But I can tell they scared out of their wits by that thing they got locked upstairs. Yes, sir. They got a tiger by the tail, and they don't know whether to hang on or run. And when Elizabeth and Booker finally meet, it's kind of comical and fun, which leads to some of the most relaxing and innocent moments in Bioshock, where Elizabeth gets to see the bright side of the world she's been locked away from for all these years, even if we lied and said we'd take her to Paris just so she would come to us. We even get to see those previously mentioned fun NPC interactions. Hey, you see a young girl? Is this some kind of sales pitch? Because I'm not interested. You see a young girl? Uh, blue skirt? No? No. But I'm without an escort if you're looking to pass the time. Hey. I'm looking for a young girl. <laughs> ah, who is it, brother? And surprisingly, how reasonable the city police are even when tearing the city apart looking for you. It really does feel like, if only for a moment, you are an immoral intruder in this society. This, of course, is ruined when a group who was warned by Comstock of your presence as you try to press. We're ready to execute. Excuse me, can I get some help here? Certainly, sir. Sorry about the wait! Ah! What are you doing? Get the girl! Get off of me! This is actually the only story choice you can make and leaves you with a banished hand or not. There were supposed to be more of these in the game, but like many things, it was shown in trailers and dropped due to a lack of direction. It really is just a shame, considering how the franchise tends to have themes about choice. Either way, Elizabeth runs away from you in fear because you killed people quite brutally. And quite understandably, from not even just a sheltered person, it would be quite terrifying. I have heard this relationship, and I don't know where, described as Booker being Gaston and Elizabeth being Belle, and I kinda like that. Booker really is a brute who uses violence to get his way, and doesn't really want to understand more than what is necessary for his job, while Elizabeth plays the peaceful mediator looking for an alternative than just violence. She plays that other half of showing compassion for the people, while still understanding she has to do what's necessary to escape and survive. It is also through this where we get to see Elizabeth really doesn't understand what her tears are entirely. She knows there are windows now, but never tries to use them as doorways. How do you do that? Whatever it is. You know how I said I had plenty of time to read? Well, I tried to figure it out. I read literature on physics and other such things. Yeah? And what did that teach you? That there's a world of difference between what we see and what is. Here, we run into probably the best early game combat section, that being the Hall of Heroes, where we need to get a shock jockey to power a Tesla coil thing so we can hijack a ship to get Elizabeth back to New York from an old friend of ours known as Slate who sided with the Vox Populi back from Wounded Knee. A real event where hundreds of natives are massacred by the government. An absolute tragedy and horrid event. The Vox Populi are also the group we've been hearing about throughout the game. 
If you listen to conversations and read a lot of the signs, they are, from what we understand now, an upcoming group who wants to bring rights back to the people who've been oppressed. And unfortunately for them, violence really is the only solution. Hence why Slate and his men were recruited. We are in combat with him and those men who want to die by your hand, and not by Comstock who is also at Wounded Knee, and claimed he was the reason it was a success and claimed all the credit. Slate views him and all of his men as cowards. He wants a real man, a real warrior to kill them so they die with honor. Doom as noble Custer was a little bighorn. We shall not yield to Comstock and his tin soldiers. But my scout has seen him. Booker Dick it is coming here to the hall. White engine of wounded knee for all the grisly trophies he claimed. Man such as he might just grant us the peace we seek. This is used as a little bit of a character dissection for Booker. He doesn't want to be that man anymore. He doesn't want to be that brutal killer that a lot of people perceive him as. But like at Wounded Knee, we are also forced to fight for our lives and be that killer. Booker fights back against this verbally and says he doesn't want to, but at the end of the day, he must be that guy. You see? You see, you're a killer, Booker! Like a Just give us the shot, Jockey. If you want the vigor, Booker, you will give my men a soldier's death. They wait for you with me and Peaky. This also shows us that Comstock is brutal in his convictions and pushing his ideology, projecting onto what happened at Wounded Knee and his savior complex for what happened at the Boxer Rebellion, which was where Columbia intervened where they shouldn't and seceded from America. We also learn here that Elizabeth is Comstock's daughter, which brings the question, why would he contain his daughter like this? Regardless, after killing his soldiers and getting to Slate, we get another choice, one that is kind of weird in my opinion. He asks you to kill him, and you can choose to prove his point that you were a killer or not in defying him and being the better man. However, in practice, I don't see it that way. Killing Slate feels like a mercy, and the better thing, because Comstock will do far worse when he gets here, and it is even implied as such if you do spare him. I really don't like how he was handled, and I was honestly left fairly unsatisfied with both choices. The only real thing left to do after this is fight through Comstock's men to get to the ship. It's on the ship when attempting to get to New York, we see that Elizabeth is really smart after being cooped up her whole life with nothing but books. She instantly recognizes the coordinates we set are in fact not Paris, but New York. She understandably is mad and knocks us out, leaving us when the Vox Populi, the group we've been hearing about, finally strikes, thinking it is Comstock. This is technically our first introduction of them, and it isn't exactly subtle what they represent with the imagery are given. Hell, even Vox Populi means voice of the people in Latin. Daisy gives us a deal for the ship. Our only real option, actually, and that is to get enough weapons to arm an army from a local gunsmith known as Chen. Because while the Vox are organized and ready to fight, they lack the weaponry. Booker quite fairly agrees, but will only help them once and ever again. Because Elizabeth and the debt is all that matters to him. Not what he believes to not be his war. The section we are brought to is one of my favorites, known as Finkton. Finkton is where all the industrial work is done for Columbia, as well as where the workers live. It is owned and managed by Jeremiah Fink, Columbia's most successful businessman. He invented most of the technological marvels we see, along with the Lutesses, who I also have neglected till now, but are the twins that always appear at the oddest moments and seem to be more than they show. Fink, of course, claimed most of the work as his and does not really believe in workers' rights creating towns that trap his workers in his systems, with constant PDAs where he seems to be desperate to tell people the Vox can't be trusted. Daisy Fitzroy and her anarchist cronies want for you? <laughs> uh, strike, they say. Uh, throw down your tools, they say. Why, I tell you, the moment you do, you 
We'll see what those hyenas are made of. Now, Mr. Fink's a good man. He worked hard, and I know he'll reward you. What a fucking liar. You've got nothing on your table but regret. Don't you see what the vile popular is selling? They're selling dreams. And dreams, my friend. They don't come cheap. This type of thing did exist a long time ago, and even somewhat now. So this has real-world parallels. Just like how I think he's supposed to be a parallel to Andrew Ryan. Just without any of the charm, convictions, or confidence that made him feel powerful. An artist strives to frame his ideals in an image. To challenge his audience and make his vision immortal. But the parasites say, No, your art must serve the cause. Your ideals endanger the people. Jeremiah Fink has a philosophy. You see, your company is like Noah's Ark. You have the lions, whose purpose is to keep order amongst the lesser creatures. Then you have the cow, the beasts of burden. Now, they provide meat, milk, and labor. And then, well, there are the hyenas. The troublemakers who only serve to rile up the cattle. Spoilers for the DLC here, which I won't talk about due to it being its own contained story and honestly really bad, but even his inventions were stolen. The Terrors were used to bring technology into existence far ahead of its time by stealing information like music and plagiarizing it, or more importantly, staying in contact with Rapture's Dr. Shu Chong in the future to develop advanced technology, tonics, and even big daddies. He even sent an expedition to where the rapture would be to get the atom to make plasmids. I mention this here because I really really don't like how this is incredibly important and honestly really interesting lore, but it's only in the DLC. Now it's kinda not an issue because you can only buy it with the DLC included, but back then this really would have annoyed me that this important bit of story is just not in the game. We chase Elizabeth for a short period of time through the beginning of Finktown, which finally gives her some good development while a little fast. You lied to her, which really hurt her, and because of that she sees you as a means to an end now. This begins what is essentially her loss of innocence and transformation to a less happy and more means to an end person. Get our airship back. You can get us out of here. Yes, I just need to supply enough weapons to arm an entire uprising. And where will we get these weapons? From one of our many friends and allies? A gunsmith in Finkton should be a walk in the park. What do you say, partners? You're a liar, Mr. DeWitt. And a thug. You're also my only means of reaching Paris. But even though we have her, we need our gunsmith and weapons from Finkton. Surprisingly, Fink lets us in and knows about us. He knows what we are and doesn't really care for the false shepherd or Columbia's beliefs at all. What he does care about is you being a former Pinkerton, a group of individuals known for violently quelling workers' rebellions a long time ago, which is something he's in dire need of right now. In modern days, the Pinkerton are known for Red Dead 2. I'm real sick, John. And sending agents after some magic cards. Th that is not a joke. So given your experience, he wants you as his chief of security and wants to test you and give us whatever we want. We then enter the gunsmith's shop to find he's gone and worships another religion. Something that obviously wouldn't fly anywhere else in Colombia. His wife tells us Fink's men took him and others to the Good Time Club for interrogation. And we have to fight there through Fink's tests. It's at this point where I am really liking the game a lot, and despite the issues, I really enjoy the story as well. Especially in the combat sections here and ahead where it really feels like the game systems are really starting to come together. It's after we find our gunsmith where things get weird to say the least. Ready? Okay, open it. Look, there's no blood. And no body. It's another world, Booker. He's dead, and Elizabeth finally takes the leap of faith and to use a terror as a doorway to bring us to a time and place where he is alive, intruding on a different reality. The people we previously killed are stuck in this almost trance-like state with bleeding noses because their body remembers dying. On top of that, things are just different here, like someone else getting our security job. Chen's wife is white now and now worships Comstock, and Chen himself is also stuck in this loop, potentially because his body remembers dying in a different time and his equipment's missing. So now we gotta go to the police station with some decent combat to grab the gear, which once again is contained and we use a tear to go around the issue. 
The only problem is this leads us, yet again, to another world where the Vox Populized Revolution is in full swing, and this here where we will remain for the rest of the game. It is this world that is most interesting, but also the most disappointing for me. Here, not only are the Vox Populi armed, but they've gone from underground movement to dominating force. Improve more and more as you move on, they are just as bad if not worse than Comstock. The Vox soldiers become your allies and fill the exact same roles as Comstock soldiers but with unique weapons. These are all cool and the gunsmiths take on Comstock's weapons with different modifications. For instance, the semi-auto carbine shoots and bursts, the shotgun becomes a one-shot monster, and the SMG is just better. <laughs> It adds a fun part to combat here and almost doubles the weapon count to make this area feel more different. The real difference comes with Booker, who has a nosebleed because in this world, he had a harder time getting to Elizabeth and instead went with Slate to join the Vox and help the war. Looks like I got a friend in town after all, Slate. He's fell in with these Vox Populi and for irregulars, I will say, they are loaded for bear. The problem is, I gotta help them with their damn revolution first. Then we take Comstock House by storm. I do that, I get the girl. But at some point, you died and became a martyr for the Vox. And unfortunately for you, being alive does not fit the narrative, and Daisy deems you must die, leaving Booker and Elizabeth stuck in the middle of a war. This is a really, really good concept that I like, but it never develops, which I understand given the story, but I wish there were more Voxophones or something that would build more on what's going on here, rather than just being a shallow view of what's happening. This game does that a lot with concepts or teases you and never shows anything. Like there is implied to be another cult dedicated to a Comstock about a raven, but it is never elaborated on besides giving us one enemy type. Even Daisy herself kind of feels used just to be a plot device for Elizabeth to move her story along, with her being Elizabeth's first real kill in the game. We need to push forward to Comstock himself or his private ship in a semi-open area. Given how this is introduced, I thought this was meant to be explored freely, but no. If you just walk around, you'll just get a bunch of sections that don't feel like there's a lot of direction and a couple lore bits. This is because you're supposed to go to Comstock's and get an objective to get Elizabeth's mom's hand, Doom style, to let us in, but gives us this. Now listen, while this area is really well designed, the boss absolutely ruined it for me. This just feels really out of place and I hated fighting her every single time. If this wasn't here, I think the game would be better because she is a destiny level bullet sponge that is not fun to fight. Even if the story here is actually kind of nice as we look for the terrors to convince the ghost to help us. Lotus says the bastard is a creation not of her womb, but of some unholy science. I do not know which is true. The child is no more divine than I. What says that for my husband's prophecy? He begs my silence, but I can only offer him forgiveness. But with repentance, need come truth. I can suffer his lies no longer. Elizabeth's mom isn't her real mom, and Elizabeth was taken from somewhere because Comstock couldn't conceive a child. She found out and hated him. More than before, as we find out, she also hated Comstock for being a monster and seeing him for what he really is. I know the prophet is a liar, but he cannot be. I know the prophet is a murderer, but he cannot be. For if the future lies only in the imagination of God, why would he reveal it to such a monster? Which is really good storytelling, just far too late. Reaching a lock, we are separated from Elizabeth by Songbird, who I also haven't mentioned. That is because he's supposed to be Elizabeth's big daddy and keep her in the tower in Columbia. Except we don't see him at all, we hear his cause from time to time, but never properly get to meet him. And that's actually all you get of him until now. But even then, it's separated as we get sent through a tear to the future. The future where Elizabeth was forced to co cooperate via horrible surgery and conditioning because she thought we left her. She became a horrible dictator and did horrendous things to the people of Columbia and even outside of it as she's the one who causes the, the New York attack we saw in a vision to happen. Old Elizabeth gives us a key item that younger her should know and sends us back. It's for her. She'll know how to read it. 
What does it say? It's advice. Advice on what? How not to become me. Yet again, another underbaked area. When back, we free Elizabeth from the surgery we heard on the logs, and she becomes much more ready to kill Comstock and use her powers even against us really? if she has to. It's okay. really good development for her. What are you going to do to stop me? Not a damn thing. Because I'm going to do it for you. Unfortunately, despite all the bad, the game's combat really clicks here at Constop Shit. It feels like everything was used together for once, and it feels like its own unique game and not just like low-level Borderlands 2 gameplay. Even when getting to Comstock, they make it a fascinating scene where he tries to reach out one last time, but Booker finally bashes his head in and has a nosebleed. We don't have time to think about the implications and go to another fantastic fight where that key given to us lets us control Songbird to help tear the attacking Vox ships out of the sky and rain debris on innocent people below. I genuinely love this section, especially how you get to see with Songbird's interactions that he is still a victim just like Elizabeth and the big daddies, even if it was a little undercooked. Unfortunately, we lose control of him after he wipes the tower Elizabeth was contained in, and that machine tethering her turret was also destroyed, unlocking her full power. The Whistler! Elizabeth! The bird, Elizabeth! I lost control! He's coming! No, he is. She brings us back to Rapture, and yes it is back because it is implied that Jack has been through here already. It looks just as beautiful as before, although not as beautiful as the DLC I'll admit, but we gotta go. She shows us all these lighthouses that represent realities and see different versions of ourselves. Fun fact, the station from System Shock was supposed to be here but was cut. Could be canon, could not, just interesting. Elizabeth plainly explains that the daughter that Booker lost was in fact her, and the debt was giving her to Comstock. He already paid off the debt, but we changed our minds. Booker branded himself out of guilt for losing his daughter, hence why Comstock said AD was the brand of the False Shepherd. Booker's brain just adjusted and made up memories so he could not break in the new reality. That's also why Booker didn't know of Columbia when Elizabeth thought it was common knowledge. It is, just not in his world. Elizabeth's solution to making sure Columbia doesn't exist is by killing the man behind it. You. He's Zachary Comstock. He's Booker DeWitt. No. I'm both. Making a world where Booker never had to give up Elizabeth, and even if it's just for one reality, they can live happily together. I really like the relationship, like I said, but I just don't know if I like this ending. I do like the after credits and that somewhere they can live happy, but I also don't understand why we had to die in the first place, or if we're the original Booker or just some random Booker. There's so many parts of the story like this, I don't know if I like the game at all when I wanted to love it. And I get what people mean about the story being love or hate and directionless. And truth be told, I'm not entirely sure how I feel about this video. I had a really difficult time making this one because I feel like there wasn't really much I could add, and when it comes to Bioshock Infinite, a lot of things worked so poorly in the story that while it feels like I'm skipping over things, in reality there just isn't really a lot to the story. There's so many parts of this game that makes me feel like it isn't done and was directionless in general, and that just makes me feel so conflicted on how I feel about this story and gameplay. The DLC, which I didn't cover, is also from a story and gameplay perspective really bad, making me not sure if going back to Rapture was a good idea. Hell, if I even liked the game, it's still up in the air for me. Am I glad I played it? Yes. Did I like it or hate it? No, I'm both. Development hell really did this game dirty, and I understand why so many people's opinion on this game has turned negative over time. I even have a hard time recommending this. If you are a diehard fan, it is the only case where I can say play it. Maybe if you know nothing of Bioshock as well, but it's iffy. If you got it in the collection, you might as well play it, but don't get the collection just for infinite. But that's about all I gotta say. I'm glad I finally know how it ended, especially since Bioshock 4 is allegedly in a nightmarish development hell and to be honest will probably never release, but I'm not done with immersive sims. My next video is going to be me finally talking about one of my all-time favorites, Prey by Arcane Studios. See you there, and I love you all.